morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever, wherever you are. I guess I'm your U.S. history teacher. I'm Zach Godfrey. Today's topic, the second Great Awakening. Before we jump right into that topic, however, I'm going to go ahead and give you some background information on U.S. history, on the stories that we've discussed and touched leading up to this particular topic, and how they all connect. So we've talked Manifest Destiny, what seems like goes on and on forever, from the War of 1812 all the way now to the Compromise of 1850 and about America's growth from east to west. We also then talked about the Industrial Revolution that occurred essentially paralleling the time frame of Manifest Destiny. As Manifest Destiny brought us east to west, uh, the Industrial Revolution increased our ability to manufacture and become a political, uh, economic, international power and, and develop independence and things like that, uh, you know, in, in the, on the world stage as a powerhouse. And so that's, that's, that's geographical growth, it's industrial and economic growth, but we change as people too. We're not the same society culturally during this 50 year window of growth and expansion. So, how do we change? Culturally, the Second Great Awakening is kind of the beginning, a catalyst for social and cultural change in the 1800s up until the, the mid-1800s, which is essentially where we are in our story. So the Second Great Awakening. Before I tell you the Second Great Awakening, I probably want to connect some dots to the First Great Awakening. So what was the First Great Awakening? And this will be kind of topic number one. The First Great Awakening was a religious movement that was kind of an extension of the Lutheran movement that kind of divided Christianity into Catholicism and Protestantism, and then the, the Puritans and the Pilgrims in England that, that continued that movement and further progressed that movement that did not want to um, you know, just blindly follow the Church of England that then came to America kind of as protest, as, as opportunity to practice religion freely without government intervention. That's, that's the First Great Awakening, essentially. And I want you to connect the First Great Awakening with the Puritanical Pilgrim Movement. And that's essentially the, the cultural movement that kind of creates America's first culture, so to speak, that colonial culture, that Puritanical Christian culture, that's the first great awakening. Uh, that's American culture and the colonial age and the, and the, the 16 and 1700s, kind of leading into the revolutionary period. So that's the first great awakening. Really quick, really easy topic. First great awakening connected to the Puritanical movements, which was an extension of like Lutheran movement and the Protestant Reformation that helped make early American culture. First great awakening, 1700s, 1600s. Second Great Awakening is another wave of a religious movement. It occurs in the early 1800s. And so now I'm going to talk about the Second Great Awakening and compare and contrast it to the first. And this is now topic two, the Second Great Awakening versus the first great awakening. Well, they're, they're both religious movements. They're both going to influence culture, American culture. They are both Christian religious movements. Um, so in that way, obviously, they're going to be similar. Here are some of the ways in which they are different. The, from my understanding, the puritanical way to, to practice uh, the Christianity at, at home and at the church and stuff was more of a, a solemn serious approach. Not that the Great Awakening is not solemn nor serious, but it was a much more of an emotional, a passionate approach uh, towards religion and Christianity. Uh, and a much more soulful, I think, way of going about uh, talking to God and connecting to God versus the Puritanical movement. So that's one difference. Another difference is the concept of predestination versus free will. The First Great Awakening 
they preach the concept of predestination, that you were put on this planet as a, a predetermined plane, already put in place by God, and your job is essentially follow God's will on this planet, and, and whatever happens to you is supposed to happen to you, because it was already predetermined, and accept that and be a good servant of God. And that was part of the puritanical movement of the First Great Awakening. The religious leaders of the Second Great Awakening kind of flipped the script on that. And they kind of make religion a lot more uh, about the community, I guess, the community as a whole, kind of you know, connecting people in the frontier and stuff like that. And they say it's not necessarily predestination that determines what happens to you. You actually have free will. And if you want to have salvation for your soul, you have to choose to follow the right path. That, that we were put on here to follow the right path. The right path isn't always just, I mean, it's put in place by following God, but you don't know necessarily the route it's going to go, and you have to choose to do what's right. It's not all predetermined. So that was a, a, a big fundamental difference between the Second Great Awakening and the First Great Awakening. I'm now going to talk some other more specific things about the Second Great Awakening. It obviously spread throughout America, but what's the difference between it spreading throughout America and the First Great Awakening? Well, the First Great Awakening happened in the middle of colonization. Like America was not even the concept that it is today. And that at best, it was 13 colonies on the East Coast. Well, in the 1800s leading up to 1850, it's growing from sea to shining sea. So if it's spreading throughout America, it's probably hitting more people and more communities. So that's, that's one thing. It allies, it like not allies, but aligns with Jacksonian democracy in this increased societal participation, political participation from common people. Remember, prior to Jackson, the Jacksonian era, even though America was the country of the free and liberty and all that stuff, the only people that could vote were like white land-owning men. But leading up to the Jackson era, many states allowed white men that didn't even own land to vote. And we started calling that like the common people. And it was an increased amount of participation in politics. And these people that never voted before because they never owned land, you know, they all fell in love with this process of political participation and obviously they showed extreme loyalty to Jackson. Well, the Second Great Awakening is kind of connect to that. And it's gonna be like a, a, a church and a religious movement for the people. A lot of times they were out in the frontier and there wasn't necessarily big established churches and stuff like that. So again, where would these pastors, these preachers for the Second Great Awakening go? They would go out to like like a field, like a camping area, settlement area, and bring pioneers and bring frontiersmen in and, and connect them. So it was more about like connecting one-on-one -on -one with God and one-on-one and -on -one with your soul versus like having to get like the top-down leadership of, of church and religion. So you're going to now see, because of the Second Great Awakening, just like the Jackson era in politics, more people just involved in society, people going to these religious uh, uh, discussions, uh, sermons from these leaders of the Second Great Awakening, and just feeling connected to society and influencing and changing it. And so that's more specific things about the Second Great Awakening. I'm going to just take it one step further for a little, little teeny topic a specific thing that the members of the Second Great Awakening or people that participate in the Second Great Awakening would do that's going to change and influence American culture. So they are going to participate in mission work. Um, most of my students, if you are a Christian, might be familiar with mission work. If you're not, we've discussed mission work before, most recently when we talked about the Alamo, because I explained what a mission is was in that time period and how with the conquistadors in uh, the territory that was New Spain, they had the intention, the desire to convert um, Native Americans to Christianity. And so the mission would, would be go to the New World and convert non-believers and that's the mission. So the Second Great Awakening had missions too, but there were also um, charitable aspects to those missions and to help the less fortunate and the people that needed assistance. And so what is that going to do? Well, it's going to lead to, to, to a focus, a change in societal focus to think about the treatment of others. When the preachers of the Second Great Awakening would, would get people together, women would go and women would participate. And now women are participating in, in these missions and in this charity work and are being, you know, outgoing participants 
in improving and thinking about society and people. And this is going to lead to a change in how we think about each other. Uh, one leader of this movement is named uh, Lyman Beecher. He's a minister. He is going to start uh, an, a, a, an extension movement from the Second Great Awakening, and that's called the Temperance Movement, the Temperance Movement. And it was all about having like, self-control and saying no to alcohol. Remember, self-control. You choose your path. And if you make the right decisions, then your soul will be saved. He's a big leader. He will be important because... Um, his daughter will be very important in America's story moving forward, and we will discuss his daughter, Harriet Beecher Stowe, in a, in a lesson or two. So that's something to keep in mind. And so the Second Great Awakening is going to be the catalyst to kind of propel different social movements that we'll see in America leading up to the mid-1800s, like the abolitionist movement, where people start going, hey, maybe slavery is not such a great thing. Maybe they, uh, slaves, enslaved individuals, have souls too, and, and therefore we should encourage to um, save their souls and not enslave them. The women's rights movement, as women participate more and more in you know, aspects of their society, they decide, and rightfully so, they begin to advocate more and more for their own equity and suffrage. The temperance movement, as I just expressed, you know, this concept of self-control, of not um, participating in sinful behaviors and it being your choice. And then other things that we've like literally never discussed when we we're talking to U.S. history, and it's crazy because we're now almost 1850, right? It's 2020, that's like 170 years ago. That's not even that many years ago. But this is gonna be a, a time, a period of time where people start thinking, hey, how do we treat people that break the law? You know, because maybe even though they break the law, like there should be a degree of humanity. It's in the Constitution, right? Like Eighth Amendment, no cruel or unusual punishment. Well, maybe we should really focus on how these people are being treated uh, to ensure that that amendment's being protected, and that they're right, even though they've been convicted of a crime, is being protected. And you know, what about like people who unfortunately suffer from mental illness or intellectual disability? This is a component of society that has a soul. We should be worrying about that and making sure that they have improved treatment. And this is not going to immediately go, boom, you know, all of these people are well taken care of because of the beginnings of these movements. But again, it's the beginning of the movements and that's where our story will, will stop. But that's what's so important about the Second Great Awakening is it's gonna be the catalyst, the what I like to call the straw, that stirs the drink that's gonna help change and evolve America's culture to where again, by the time we get to 1850, instead of passively resisting slavery or being indifferent or turning a cheek, people are more outspoken about what is or isn't right in regards to how we treat human beings. I miss you guys. I love you guys. Make sure to take the online assignment that's connected to this lecture. Make sure to stay active, because it's so incredibly important. And be nice to the people that are nice to you. And be nice to people that are nice to you, too, because maybe they need you to be nice. And it's the right thing to do. See you guys later. Peace.